Welcome to the Outhouse Lounge, where we relax and talk about stuff. I've got to change that tagline. I'm Chris Cordani, your host. With me in the lounge today is a gentleman who I found very intriguing. He's a New York Times best-selling author, and we'll talk about that because he wrote quite a bit of books. One that he wrote was called My Merrill, and it has a, uh, an interesting subtitle, but I want to get into this. Jay Margallis, you wrote the book. I want to really emphasize that I'm not a big, or I would never was a big fan of the starlets of the past. Um, I was never a huge Marilyn Monroe fan, but reading your book opened some very interesting things about her to me. And I became, uh, let's put it this way, I have now become more into the Marilyn Monroe camp for a lot of reasons. One of which is because you opened up the fact that she, despite her act, despite the fact that she um, her persona was the blonde bombshell, the sort of dizzy outlook in life. She was quite intelligent. That is correct. And I really wanted to do this book with Terry because when I called her up, I said, hey, you should write a book, Terry. You knew her for 14 years. You knew her longer than any of her three husbands. And she said, well, I don't want people thinking I'm trying to get in the spotlight because in Maryland, I'm trying to profit off of knowing her because there are a lot of people accused of that. And she doesn't want that to happen to her because that's not what she's her aim was anyway. And she didn't even really want to write the book. She said, let me talk to my, my stepbrother, Michael Reagan, who was uh, President Ronald Reagan's son. And uh, so they talked together, and, and she got back to me. And um, uh, Michael uh, told her, said, look, you knew her um, really well, and, and you guys adopted her. Um, you were the family that took care of her. Um, Terry's uh, grandmother, Nana, was the real mother that Marilyn never had because when Marilyn was seven, her mother was institutionalized. So Nana became Terry's mother for 14 years from 1948 until 62 when Marilyn died. And so there was a family that adopted her and that cared for her. And that was unknown up until this time. And so uh, I'm really grateful that Terry turned around and said, yeah, I'll write the book, but I don't want to do any interviews because I'm not trying to be in the spotlight because of this woman who was very nice to me. Jay, you mentioned Terry. That's Terry Carger, your co-author. Again, the book is My Merrill, Marilyn Monroe, Ronald Reagan, Hollywood, and Me. So we can get into quite a bit here. First, Terry Carger. Who is she? She is part of a, a, a Hollywood family, by the way. Uh, and yes. I do want to tell our audience that Terry Carger has known Marilyn Monroe since she was a very young girl. In fact, Marilyn used to babysit her. Right. So when Terry was about six years old, she met a 21-year-old Marilyn who was dating Terry's father, who was 32 at the time. And that in 1948, Fred was assigned by Columbia Pictures to be her vocal coach to improve her singing voice for Ladies of the Chorus. And if you listen to those two songs that she had to do for that movie, her singing voice is just beautiful and very um, 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 wonderful to listen to. And you think to yourself, wow, she really improved really quick. And so this is when, um, during this period of time, when Marilyn Monroe was babysitting Terry and Marilyn hadn't quite made it, she was still a contract player. And so they knew her before she was famous, during the time she was becoming famous, and then all the way up until her death. And uh, see, when Terry was a teenager, uh, you know, Terry said that Marilyn used to, said, used to say, let's talk about makeup and men. So they would go into uh, different ways about how to use eyeshadow. So, you know, Marilyn would uh, teach uh, little Terry how to do eyeshadow on her face, uh, all the little moves that she did at the Blue Book Modeling Agency. And they would go out to... Uh, um, get chocolate sundaes at Will Wright's um, Sunday shop, and they would also go to a Christian Science Church because... Oh, well, well, I want to stop you there. The chocolate sundaes and makeup, wouldn't that kind of ruin the makeup? That, that might have been a problem, right? I'm sure maybe Marilyn taught her how to keep the makeup uh, intact while eating the chocolate sundaes. That's something we should all learn. Well, you know, Marilyn was a minimalist with makeup, so they wouldn't really be like running mascara down her face. And they weren't crying or anything unless they were crying from laughter at the people watching they were doing. But that is highly unlikely. Um, but I, I think it was a very beautiful relationship because it was very innocent. Marilyn used to play hide and seek with Terry and her cousins. And for the younger kids, you know, she would uh, find uh, easier places to hide. And for the older kids, she would find very difficult places to hide. And, and she was just a very innocent woman. And this is something that we just don't see in the other books. And that's why I wanted to become a part of this project. 
according to Terry, and of course your research through her, what kind of babysitter was was Marilyn Monroe? I, I'm curious about that. Again, I've, I've, I've become more uh, involved in, in wanting to be in that Marilyn Monroe camp. So I'm wondering, was she more like a Julie Andrews babysitter since she could sing and she was getting the, the, the vocal lessons or maybe something more or less uh, closer to, I don't know, well, I don't, I don't think as closer, I don't think very close to the grandma and flowers in the attic, but I'm talking about maybe a, a, a Frau Fraustein from whatever her name was on, uh, on the, oh my God, the Austin Powers movies. There we go. So where is that? From, from a scale of Julie Andrews to Frau from, uh, from the Austin Power, Powers movies, <laughs> where, was, where was Marilyn Monroe as a babysitter? Definitely not the Austin Powers. Uh, a more, <laughs> kind of a little bit like Julie Andrews in the respect that when Terry was going through the divorce of her parents, you know, uh, Terry would complain to Marilyn, say, I'm going through a really rough time right now. And Ter and uh, Marilyn would go come back at her and say, well, you know, Terry, you should be grateful. You have parents that you actually know. I never knew my parents. That's a blessing. You should be grateful for that. And then she would also, uh, whenever Terry would talk back to her a mother or her father, uh, Marilyn would take her aside in the other room and would say, hey, look, you know, you should go, go apologize to your mother for saying that. You shouldn't talk back to your parents. And so it was, it was uh, Terry said she was kind of surprised because, you know, Marilyn seemed so, such, so much like a free spirit. But then when she would come back with these orders, it seemed kind of um, unusual, but it, it was almost like, you know, Marilyn was trying to be a good parent, like a surrogate parent to Terry, you know, like treating her like a daughter because for 14 years, that's a pretty long relationship. It's almost like sisterly, motherly, and, and like an aunt, you know, all at the same time. And so it was a very special relationship that Terry really treasured because, uh, but Marilyn would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And sometimes, you know, Terry would say, I'd like to be a spy or I'd like to be an ice cream truck driver, silly things like that. But then one time Terry said, I'd like to be a teacher. And Marilyn says, that's good. You know, but you, teachers are good um, people in society that can really help people out and improve themselves. And, and so uh, Marilyn says, looks will get you far, but not as far as a good education. And that was a quote that really stuck with Terry because she ended up becoming a teacher of elementary school children for 28 years. Very inspirational, but I will have to say, spies do help people too. Okay, <laughs> yes. we, we and and we've had some on this program, so ju just so you know, and I want them kind of following you around after that. Besides, they'll be back on too. So, spies not only help people, just like teachers do, but they also prove as uh, very excellent guests on the Outhouse Lounge. <laughs> <laughs> Just when I get there, I'm here with Jay Margolis. He's the author of several books, including, of course, the one we're talking about, My Merrill, Marilyn Monroe, Ronald Reagan, Hollywood, and Me. Marilyn was quite insightful from what I understand about your book. We talked about how intelligent she was, which is, again, the opposite of her persona, or at least what got her rich. But then again, if you think about it, she knows where the money is and how to get it. Again, very smart, right? Right. And, and the thing is that sometimes she just didn't want to, even though she knew where the money was at, she actually made a statement saying, I don't care about money. I just want to be wonderful. She made that to Pete Martin in 1956. And she uh, just really, you know, never lived up to those rich means as everyone thought that she was going to become rich when she was doing her last incomplete film, Something's Got to Give. She was paying the mortgage just like everybody else. Then so on her last house or, or, or her first and last house. And so uh, it, the thing about Marilyn is that she actually fought against the studio at a certain point. She teamed up with Milton Green to form Marilyn Monroe Productions, forming a female production company during a time in the 50s. And that was kind of unheard of. And she did a bus stop and the Prince and the Showgirl, you know, during this time to make smarter movies. See, bus stop, she was doing a, a, an Ozark accent, which was very convincing and you know, uh, Don Murray, her co-star, who I interviewed, thought that she should have been nominated and, and winning the Academy Award for that performance because she was so wonderful in it and that she did such a great job. And so she did have opportunities to choose movies that weren't the dumb blonde roles. And, and then she did realize that, you know, she had to do something like Some Like It Hot, you know, which was later, you know, it, because that's what people wanted and that she wanted to, you know, get back on the map. So she did realize that there was a, a time when she couldn't resist making movies like that. I guess she had to, but again, she knew where the money was. 
the good thing is she got to show her real acting chops because back then, and it even happens now, but uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and the 80s, people got typecasts. You know how hard it was for Henry Winkler to find work after Happy Days because people thought of him as the Fonz. There were a lot of these uh, people who played certain types of characters. You couldn't put them somewhere else. You, you did have your character actors, your, your guys that could do a lot of different things. But Marilyn, to avoid or at least to try to avoid being typecast, she did have to put her own studio together. Uh, but again, she she did get to show the world she had some real acting chops. And that's another thing that your book opens up that, uh, that again – puts it's going to put a lot more people into the Marilyn Monroe was really that great it was really as great as people were saying camp and that's a good thing right. yeah I mean she was a wonderful person you know she uh, was just someone who wanted to be respected and to be adored but for the right reasons you know not to be uh, you know denigrated and there, she would get letters from people saying that oh you, you played this uh, tramp in Niagara and she says well I was just acting it would be yeah. silly to think if people thought you were what you were when you were just simply acting. And that's not how I am in real life. You know, I get over it. You know? <laughs> Amazing. It, but people cannot, and, and it still happens now. People seem to, or a lot of people seem to have trouble separating f a, a truth from, or, or movies, fiction from reality. That's not a good thing. But again, movies are an escape. And, that's, and, and, and Marilyn Monroe's movies were a great escape for a lot of people in, uh, in that era. Exactly. I have with me Jay Margolis. He is the author of My Merrill, uh, Marilyn Monroe, Ronald Reagan, Hollywood and Me. Terry Carter, your co-host, also knew Ronald Reagan and Jane Wyman very well. She had crossed paths with, with a lot of great people in Hollywood. Yes. You know, when uh, Terry was 11 years old, this was five years after uh, Marilyn first became her babysitter, um, you know, her father, Fred Carter, married Jane Wyman, who had won an Academy Award. For Johnny Belinda in 1948, and they, and and Wyman had been recently um, divorced from Ronald Reagan, so Michael and Marine Reagan became Terry's stepbrother and stepsister, and they got to go to uh, swimming together. Every morning, Michael Reagan and, and Terry would play gin rummy. Uh, Marine Michael and Terry would scare away the tour buses that came to J Jane Wyman's house. They would put uh, antique. They would take an antique coffee grinder. And put cheeseburgers in there and see what would happen if they kind of ground it up. And Jane Wine would get horrified. She'd make them clean up that mess. And there were a lot of like childish things they would do, but because they were children, that's what they were doing. And they got to go to the Ronald Reagan ranch. In fact, uh, Terry's cousin Johnny, his parents were having marital problems. So Jane Wyman says, Why don't you come to the Ronald Reagan ranch while your parents separate out their issues? And so Ronald Reagan taught cousin Johnny how to shoot a rifle. They went swimming in the lake. They cut wood, and Terry had her own goat on the ranch. It was a real thing. And well, a lot of fun. well, Terry, Terry, time to play with your pet goat. I'm going to take Johnny out hunting, and we're going to go out and uh, hunt some raccoons and stuff like that. And uh, enjoy your horsey, okay? Yep, there we go. Just don't put any more cheeseburgers in the cheeseburger grind. I mean, coffee grinder. You know, Jane yells at me for doing that too. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny stuff, I'll tell you. Jay, the book My Merrill, and I want to I want to get into this because you, it, it's Marilyn Monroe's life was, well, it was enchanting at least to the people who who were watching her on screen. But the fact is, it was tragic in other ways too, and she unfortunately passed on at a very young age. The news media calls it a, to this day; it's called a suicide. You and Terry, however have other ideas. Yes. Let's get into that. In fact, uh, Terry told me, she said, I never believed that Marilyn committed suicide because the day before on uh, August 3rd, you know, August 4th is when Marilyn died. August 3rd, uh, Marilyn called up all her friends, including Nana, Terry's grandmother, she just absolutely loved, was like a mother to Marilyn, and said, hey, look at my Life magazine article with Richard Merriman. It just came out today. You know, this is such a wonderful article. He let me speak in my own words. And it was, and she's just so elated and everything. Why would she kill herself the next day? And and so you know, all these people are saying that she didn't kill herself. And then you know, when when the stories come out on August fifth, when the police arrive and they take her body away before the autopsy is even performed, you got press reports saying that she committed suicide or as an accidental death. 
they hadn't even performed the autopsy yet, and they're telling everybody how she died. It's like that's not how it works, you know. Well, we know we know now not to trust the press when they say somebody committed suicide, <laughs> especially if they jump out and say without even an investigation. If they jump out and say this person died because of suicide or committed suicide, you got to think, hey, wait a minute, something's wrong here because they jump to that conclusion rather fast in a, in an in an industry where you're trained to investigate and try to figure things out. Exactly. And so another problem with her not committing suicide, say, well, of course, anybody could commit suicide. But under these circumstances, when the autopsy was done by Dr. Thomas Noguchi, there was absolutely not one undissolved capsule in her stomach, just 20 cc's of a brownish mucoid fluid. That's all he noticed. No refractile crystals from either sleeping pill of Nebutal or the chlorohydrate that was found in her blood. They did the toxicology um, test and they came back. And it, and it determined that there were approximately the equivalent of 47 nebutals in her blood and then about 17 chlorohydrates in her blood, not in her stomach, but the amount that was in her blood. That's enough drugs to kill three people. And so uh, people say, well, how on average did, uh, many pills did Marilyn take every day? Uh, Ralph Roberts, who was her best friend in Masseur, said, well, she took about six nebutals a day. So for her to have 47 of them and then 17 chlorohydrates on top of that, that's just overkill. You know, there's no way that she could have taken all that and not have any appear in her stomach. You know, Dr. Sidney Weinberg took an independent look at this from, from New York, in Suffolk County, New York. And he said that she did not, you know, die by um, taking the sleeping pills through her mouth. Another way to corroborate this is that there was a Schaefer ambulance called that night. You know, Mrs. Murray, the housekeeper, responsibly called an ambulance and she found her um, employer nude, face down, leaning on the phone in the guest cottage and she called Schaefer Ambulance. And I spoke with three Schaefer Ambulance attendants um, that remember that call. Uh, Schaefer Ambulance attendant Edgardo Villalobos, uh, Carl Balanzi, who was a former vice president of Schaefer Ambulance, and also Ruth Tarnowski. They all said that Joe Tarnowski dispatched that call that night. And what happened was that Edgardo said that he got the call first, but he was over at Beverly and Western. He couldn't have gotten there. He was going 100 miles an hour. It's 15 minutes away. So he dispatched the call um, to uh, James Hall and Murray Leibowitz, who pick up the story, and they're right around UCLA. They get there in about two minutes or less, and they, they, um, they find this hysterical woman, who they later discover as Maryland's publicist, Pat Newcomb, and this woman is screaming and saying, she's in there, I think she's dead, I think she's dead. And then James Hall, the attendant, says, what's wrong with her? And Pat says, I think she took some pills. And so, you know, James Hall goes to smell Maryland's mouth, and he says, well, there's no indication of vomit. There's no odor of pear, which is a fruity smell from the chlorohydrate. You would notice a pear smell. There was nothing, no odor of drugs in general. And then he said her, co her color was turning blue. Her face was turning blue. So they took her off the you know, bed, and they put a resuscitator on her. Her color's coming back, and they're about to get her into the um, ambulance when this guy jumps in, and he says, I'm her doctor. Give her positive pressure. James Hall later identified this doctor as Maryland psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson. And he, and he pulls out a hypodermic syringe from his medical bag with a heart needle already affixed to it. He fills it with a brownish fluid, and then he injects it into her heart and then says, I'm going to pronounce her dead. You can leave. And, and that's what happened. That's how Marilyn got murdered. That's, that's a strong word, murder, which leads me to my question. And you do raise this as well in the book, and you mentioned that a little earlier. Marilyn Monroe, potential whistleblower? Yes. What happened was that uh, she had a, she was going to threaten a press conference, and we know this because there was a CIA document dated August third, nineteen sixty-two, one day before she died, and in the CIA document, it shows that they were wiretapping Bobby Kennedy in Maryland, and they got the following information: that Maryland was going to hold a quote-unquote press conference. She was going to tell all. She was going to uh, um, reveal what was in her diary of secrets and what the newspapers would disclose with such information. And she, about the bases in Cuba and the president's secret plot to kill Castro, President Kennedy's secret plot to kill Castro. You couldn't have Marilyn running around you know, divulging national security secrets on TV on Monday morning. They kill her on Saturday. 
Oh, hold on a second. If you say that JFK had a, a, a decent idea to kill Castro, he might have been hailed as a national hero. So I don't think I don't think he wanted to hide that, but I'm pretty sure there are a lot of other things that the very powerful people wanted to hide. And well, she probably knew a lot of secrets, if you think I, about it. Look who she ran look who she ran away ran with. I think it's kind of like saying that Biden wants to go kill Putin. You don't reveal that on national TV. You know, I mean it's not I don't think that's a very it's a it'd be a scandal. Because we don't, you know, think of our leaders as killing other national leaders, especially back then. You know, it's a secret thing. You know, you, they were, had exploding cigars. You heard the whole bit about how they tried to get rid of them. And um, but I, I think that would be a huge scandal. But also, she was going to reveal the affairs that she was having with Robert and John Kennedy. That's but you a see, big one. here's here's what what's interesting about the psychiatrist. You're saying, well, how? Why did the psychiatrist do this? Who got him to do this? Well, Peter Lawford did an interesting interview one a year before he died, and he said the following. He said, Marilyn has got to be silenced, Bobby told Greenson, or something to that effect. Greenson had thus been set up by Bobby to take care of Marilyn. Now, people say, well, how did Greenson take care of Marilyn? The two attendants, they with the heart needle. And so you got these three people who are witnesses. There's two other witnesses, Pat Newcomb, who we mentioned already, and James Hall said that she saw it. And then uh, as uh, Greenson was injecting her in the heart, um, Peter Lawford enters the guest cottage with Sergeant Marvin Ionone. So there are other two uh, witnesses. Sergeant Marvin Ionone worked with the Kennedy as security detail as a young sergeant at 29 years old at that time. Now, what's interesting about this is the fact that Peter Lawford said that Bobby called up Dr. Greenson on the day that Marilyn died and said, hey, look, Greenson, first thing Monday morning, Marilyn's going to go public with me and Jack. But she's also going to go public with you, too, Greenson, about your affair with her. And so that was the lie. You see, Marilyn only was going to go public with Bobby and Jack. But Bobby lied to Greenson, convinced Greenson that his affair would be exposed as well, which was not true. So Bobby used Greenson to get rid of Marilyn. Of course now you think about it. Hey, yeah, yeah, Bobby, uh, uh, Bobby says, hey, uh, Marilyn's going Marilyn's to try to take down two of the most powerful people in the country by saying she had an affair with us. Oh, yeah, and she's going to tell everybody about yours, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that people would care about uh, her uh, boinking the psychiatrist. Or, or, no, uh, but this whole psychoanalytic yeah. career would be done in tatters. You know, it, it was a very serious violation to sleep with your patient. And they had audio recordings of it, according to Peter Lawford. He heard the psychiatrist sleeping with Marilyn on audio recordings. And so they had actual tapes. It wasn't just like, you know, here he, he said, she said. And it was well, like, They had the tapes. That's a different story. Okay, now I got you there. Okay. They had tapes. Believe me. <laughs> there's always something. There, there's always something. But the, the one thing that, and, I, and again, knowing what's going on now with the media, it doesn't surprise me, and it might have back then, it doesn't surprise me that the media just went into lockstep with what was being told, with, with the Hollywood and government narrative that Marilyn Monroe committed suicide. This also is the era of the uh, of the Edward Murrows of the world, and people who wanted to be just like him and, and uncover big stories. But for some reason, this was a no-go for a lot of these people. That's a problem. It is a big problem. And, you know, another thing that you got to put into perspective with this whole thing that really seals the deal about these guys being guilty of murder is the fact that 20 minutes after Greenson injected her at 12, 10 a.m. on August 5th, 1962, that's about four hours before Greenson officially called the police. And in fact, it says Dr. Engelberg, a physician, called the police, but that's wrong. Greenson did, and he, meant, he admitted that in a 1973 article. And in fact, Sergeant Clemens says that he remembers Greenson calling him at the station. So you, we all know that Greenson called the police. So anyway, so after Greenson injects her about 20 minutes later at Olympic and Robertson Boulevard, Detective Lynn Franklin of the Beverly Hills Police Department pulls over Peter Lawford, who's driving drunk in a Lincoln Continental sedan, and he's going like 80 miles an hour, headlights off, and, and Lynn Franklin knows Peter Lawford. He says, hey, Pete, what are you doing, man? You're going so fast. And Peter Lawford says, I got to get the attorney general over here back to San Francisco because he needs to get out of town. And, and uh, so, you know, Lynn Franklin recognized Bobby Kennedy, and he also recognized Peter Lawford, as I said. And then he says, who's this guy in the front seat next to um, you, Peter? And Pete says, oh, he's just a doctor. He's riding along with us. And later, through funeral footage, Franklin was able to identify the doctor as Ralph Greenson. So they were all three of the guys were together seven miles from the crime scene, 20 minutes after it happened. Do you really believe that if Marilyn had committed suicide, which the physical evidence says that she couldn't have, that he's really going to be there before she dies and then after she dies 
and that you know the, it's the the real story is that he's not supposed to even be there you know john bates a lawyer in, in gilroy california said oh he never left our ranch over here you know and and we got you know uh, what's his name uh, Daryl Gates. We got Daryl Gates, the former police chief, writing his autobiography, who contradicts, you know, J uh, John Bates' story about, you know, Bobby never leaving, and saying that yes, when you always knew that Bobby Kennedy was in in Los Angeles on August fourth, nineteen sixty two. He wrote that in his autobiography. So we got the chief of police of saying that he was there, and so you know he was there. We had witnesses. We had Detective Lynn Franklin. We had uh, next door neighbor Mary W. Goody Coons Barnes, who was playing bridge with her four friends, including Elizabeth Pollard. They all saw Bobby Kennedy there that day. It was supposed to be a secret trip to Los Angeles. Publicly, he wasn't there, but secretly he was. It wasn't supposed to be a public story. Uh, and and that's how this, that's how these things work. It was probably a lot easier to cover up. I mean. I know it wasn't easy to cover up, but probably a lot easier to cover up than it might have been now. The fact is, though, uh, it was the media went into lockstep. Everybody around the Kennedys went into lockstep. People in Hollywood were either relieved or went into lockstep about this. And poor Marilyn Monroe never, ever got justice. And that, again, another problem, a big issue with me, especially after reading your book. Yes, absolutely. It's just not fair. And I, I think that a lot of people, they come up to me and said, well, you did a really good thing by putting all the pieces together because a lot of the pieces, you know, were, were there and I did additional research. And through my additional research, I was able to put together the ambulance part of the story, which is very crucial to, you know, point in the fact that she was murdered. Because once we realized that Dr. Greenson murdered her and it's a Kennedy connection, we realized there was no mafia connection. Uh, close enough, I say. Uh, but then, yeah, I'm on the record. Close enough. OK, that's it. Well, well, that's the thing is that, you know, you have three eyewitnesses, two attendants and Peter Lawford, the brother in law, of Robert Kennedy. They all say Greenson did it. And then Pat Newcomb, um, you know, James Hall challenges Pat Newcomb, says she was there. She saw the needle go into the heart. I Well, she come forward. And and this, this guy, Sergeant Marvin Iannone, he was wearing a blue uniform. He saw his little name tag and he knew that was Marvin Iannone who got chief of police promotion really quickly to Beverly Hills later on. And Bobby Kennedy had a lot to do with this, as you're saying, and you'll see a lot of a bit of that in the book. But you've done quite a bit on Bobby Kennedy's death, which has its own set of uh, strange circumstances around it. Oh, absolutely. And you're, on, and you're working on more, by the way. I have to say that you're working on some more books about it. Yes, I'm working on two books on the Robert Kennedy assassination. The first book I'm working on by myself with nobody else as a co-author and it's uh, just going to be a full-length book on Robert Kennedy's assassination about who really killed him. I've interviewed two eyewitnesses who actually, out of a six-man photo lineup, chose the same killer as a third shooter. And that's never been done before in history. And so, you, you know, it's, it's one thing for, you know, one witness to pick out this one person. But it's another thing for another person to pick out the same guy. And they're not picking Sirhan. They're not picking a Sirhan lookalike in the lineup. They're not picking the second shooter who is rumored to be the killer, uh, Thane Eugene Caesar. He's now passed away. Um, and so I've interviewed people who have never been interviewed before. I've interviewed people like Don Schulman, who, who recently passed away. He hadn't been interviewed since the 1970s. He was, uh, at the time, the only witness to have seen the security guard fire a gun that we knew of. And I've since discovered another eyewitness because he said there was a woman standing next to me who also saw the security guard fire a gun. And so I sent him a, 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 you know, some pictures and I said, is this the woman that you saw? And he says, I'm 99% sure that's the woman I saw. And so when I contacted the woman, uh, I finally got a hold of her. I talked to her twice, one year apart on phone calls. And uh, she said that, yes, that gentleman was standing behind me. So she recognized Schulman, you know, and I can't reveal what her name is now because I don't want to give away my research. Nobody knows this. But she has been since um, before she's been known as unidentified woman. That's all she's been known as. And so I, I can't really give that name away without giving away my research. But it's explosive in that respect. And it's, it's really interesting because uh, Don Schulman says that what he saw was that as Sirhan was firing towards Kennedy, two to six feet away, you know, there was another guy right behind Kennedy, the uniformed security guard, pulled out his gun and fired, you know, hitting Kennedy. He said the security guard shot Kennedy. He said Caesar disappeared for quite some time. And my publisher at the time, when I published that in my, uh, murder, uh, the Murder of Marilyn Monroe case closed book, 
my publisher wouldn't allow me to say, you know, Caesar. They put he, and they changed it to he because he was still alive. They didn't want to put his name next to the that security guard shot Kennedy thing. Well, it looks like somebody uh, paid your your publisher a visit. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I will say this. You, you bring up things like this. You talk about proof and you try to discuss these things and you're shouted down. And I, I've been shouted down and I have a lot of friends who have been shouted down when we come up with ideas or or some proof about things. We're, we're called conspiracy theorists. We're called uh, 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 horrible things like cons uh, that, that relate to conspiracy theorists. But I will tell you this. A conspiracy theorist is always harmless until they're on to something. That's right. And, and you know, see, the third shooter is, is what's really the key here is because uh, Thad Eugene Caesar shot him twice to the right armpit. These are non-lethal shots, according to Thomas Noguchi, who also did Marilyn Monroe's autopsy. He um, now does Robert Kennedy's autopsy. He said the two non-lethal shots to the right armpit, he would have lived. So you can't say that the security guard is the murderer because he didn't do the headshot. You see, the security guard says, I got some powder burns in my eyes. He goes like this. He wipes his eyes like this. <laughs> he says that, well, but people are, are saying, well, you're an idiot, Caesar. You just admitted that you went like this and, and then it went blue back into your face. But no, what he's really saying is that the third shooter came in between him and Kennedy and, and, and went bam. And then it sprayed into his face, you know, from the side like this. And so the third shooter's gun is where he got the powder in his eyes. And he was trying to blame the powder on Sirhan, but, you know, the, the, the powder doesn't blow forward because Sirhan's, you know, like 180 degrees in front of him. So why would the powder go forward? It only goes to the side or back of a gun. So, you know, Caesar needs a little bit of training on how blowback works, you know, on the gun. But that leads me to Sirhan Sirhan. Now, first of all, what do they give him, a cap gun? Because there were, his bullets weren't even in the guy. That's that's something that you bring up as well. But, but what did they give him, a fake gun, some kind of uh, a toy or whatever? I, I, no. Or something, or blanks? What, what, or was he that bad of a shot? Well, here, here's the thing, is that uh, after his second shot, he was restrained by Carl Euchre, and they, put his, they slammed his arm against the steam table, and he was shooting wildly into the ceiling. And, and that's what Carl Euchre was saying. So how could he get any of those, you know, four shots impacted on one going through, harmlessly through his suit coat, two going into his right armpit, one going into his head? It's just not possible. He was not given a cap gun. Uh, there's a lot of researchers that say, oh, he was just uh, given a cap gun. These, he was shooting blanks. You know, Rayford Johnson, you know, was an Olympic decathlon. He knew the difference between a cap gun and he actually took hold of the gun you know, and, and put it in his pocket and gave it to the police afterwards. You think that he wouldn't have said, hey, this is a cap gun? In fact, <laughs> you, know, if the, he, you know, Sirhan bought a gun with uh, his brother's help before the assassination. So this was an actual gun that he purchased, not a cap gun. He'd be, he'd be saying to his brother, what are you doing with a cap gun? You know, and, and there wouldn't be enough bullets to go around if it was if Sirhan wasn't firing real bullets. Sirhan actually did hit some of the other five people in the pantry that day, but he just didn't hit Kennedy. And it wasn't because he was a bad shot. It's just that, you know, the autopsy says that Kennedy was shot one inch from behind the right ear. Now, if he's facing him the whole time like this and he gets no closer than two feet, how could he go over here? He's in the incorrect firing position. That's where the second and third shooters come in. And, and they were the ones that, you know, murdered Kennedy. In fact, you, you have to call the third shooter the murderer, because if it was just the second shooter's shots, you know, Caesar's shots, and the third shooter didn't have a chance to get in there, then, then you know, he would have survived and he wouldn't have died. But because the third shooter got his head shot in there, that's the fatal shot that murdered Kennedy. And that's why the third shooter is the murderer, not Caesar. It, it takes a team effort to kill a Kennedy, I guess. That's that's just uh, apparently what history is showing us. Unfortunately for Sirhan Sirhan, as you know, earlier this month or earlier in March, he was uh, denied parole once again. Yes, and and it's, it's you know the thing is, there's this thing called the felony murder rule. It means that if you're in the act of committing a felony, and, and you are going to be as responsible, uh, you know, even though you didn't actually pull the trigger you're going to be just as responsible as someone who did, you know? And so even though he's guilty of attempted murder, um, you know, he should still be in jail because th that's what it is. It's basically a life sentence on the political figure. You can just let him out of jail. I, I think it's absolutely ludicrous for a, a lot of these researchers. There are plenty of them 
who think that Sirhan should be let out of jail. I don't think so. He Some of the Kennedy that. family supported that too, by the way, a couple of years back. Oh, I know, and they're still supporting it, you know, and I, I think it's kind of um, ridiculous because I have evidence. I interviewed a police officer um, who saw one of the polka dot dress girls and photo identified her and saw her with Sirhan um, uh, and, and was at a party um, let's see, at Ronnie's restaurant two weeks before Robert Kennedy was assassinated, an event where Robert Kennedy was speaking. So Sirhan was stalking Robert Kennedy two weeks before the assassination. It wasn't like he just came in there, got hypnotized, and that, oh, he's so innocent. And he's <laughs> accident, let's let him out of jail because he didn't really do it. You know, he's part of this conspiracy. He chose to be a part of it, and he knows more than he's telling See, kids, there was a time when California was actually tough on criminals. That was a long, long time ago. Time but, ago. Uh, it was the time. Uh, the other one, California is never going to let out two people. Two people are never getting parole as long as they live. That would be Sirhan Sirhan and Brenda Spencer. Mark my words. Those two are never getting parole. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. You know, Sirhan, I mean, you know, see, the thing is that why would somebody let Sirhan out? I mean, it's just, there's just no basis for it. You know, it, it just makes no sense. And, and it just, he, he, you know, decided to be a part of the conspiracy. Why does he deserve his freedom? I, I never understood why researchers went that path or why researchers said, oh, he was shooting blanks. Yeah, if he was shooting blanks, believe me, people would know about it. It <laughs> doesn't matter. He was still part of the conspiracy. I get that. Yeah. Uh, because even if he was the decoy or the guy that was given the, uh, the fake bullets, he was still part of it. He was the distraction. So he wanted to do it, too. The problem just, is the other guys never got uh, never got thrown in jail, never got uh, uh, thrown in the old pokey. Right. And that's what's so crazy about it is that there are a total of four eyewitnesses that saw this third shooter firing his gun. Four people that I've discovered have seen that, you know, and um, it, it's just really fascinating that we have that many people see this thing. And it's and, you know, it's a, it's a very incredible thing. And, and to have the, him walking around, he's still alive. He's, you know, he's out and about and he hasn't been arrested or he never will be. And again, it was just the acceptance of the narrative coming out of um, coming out of uh, the mouths of the first people on, on the scene. I'm, I'm just I'm exaggerating that point. But the point is uh, government narrative. Hey, this guy shot him. Nobody else was involved, or at least we can't get, we'll never find the other guys if there were any. And anybody who speaks otherwise is a conspiracy theorist. Fact is, you, uh, you got these accounts, you got the witness accounts, people saw what happened. That's right. And a lot of people try to discredit eyewitness accounts, but when they're all independently saying the same thing, you got to kind of wonder, they didn't just make it up out of their brain. They didn't just suddenly, you know, hey, let's all just get together and and do some telekinesis and we'll get the right, uh, we'll all say the same exact thing. I mean, I can understand eyewitness testimony being a little bit, you know, flaky, but you know, when you have like the same exact testimony four times in a row, come on, you gotta kind of say to yourself, maybe there's something to it. And, and it's just, I feel very strongly about it. I've done this type of eyewitness testimony that nobody else has done before. And for anybody to go around and say it doesn't mean anything is gonna be really a, a tragedy. But there's also physical evidence, you know, that there were more than eight bullets fired. You know, I mean, think about it. You had um, one bullet each recovered from each of the victims. OK, so that's five. Right. Then you have, you know, four impacted on Kennedy, you know, two that went into his right armpit, um, one that went into uh, his head and then one that went harmlessly through his suit coat. That's already, um, you know, uh, nine bullets. OK, but let's say that you want to just talk about the ones that didn't exit. OK, let's just talk about those. So you have two that did not exit Kennedy. So that's two. And then there were uh, five that didn't exit the victim. That's seven. And then you have two in the door frame over here that were uh, an FBI agent. William Bailey said that there were two bullets picked out of that door frame. That's nine. OK, that's one more bullet than Sirhan had in his gun. And I'm not trying to just focus on anything but the fact that let's just try to focus that if there's one more beyond eight, then there's a conspiracy, you know, because I'm obviously mentioning more than that. If you want to account for the ricochets, you know, for, uh, um, you know, Erwin Stroll got another shot into his pant uh -huh. leg, you know, and so that's like 10. And then you have, uh, um, um, you know, Vincent DiPiero has an orange sweater, 11 through his, you know, <laughs> his orange sweater. 
I mean, if you want to say those are ricochets or a couple bullets in the ceiling, I mean, it's it's just you know there it could have been some of them were, were ricochets, sure. You know, in fact, there was a ricochet that went um and and went down onto the floor and then went upward and hit um Elizabeth Evans in the head and it stuck in her head. Oh. So, but what I'm trying to explain is that look, when we talk about no exit wound, you know, trajectories, you have five that didn't exit on each of the one victims, and you have two in Kennedy that didn't exit, that's seven, and then two in the doorframe, that's nine. So you already have a problem by just dealing with, with bullets that were not accounted for by ricochets. We discussed the whys when it came to Marilyn Monroe. Yes, Marilyn Monroe, a potential whistleblower. You gotta think, Robert F. Kennedy knew a lot of crap about a lot of people. <laughs> Marilyn was minor league compared to what any Kennedy might know. So this is the next question. I know you delve into all this other stuff, but about the whys, what's your perspective, Jay, on the whys um, when it came to RFK's murder? Well, um, he was going to reopen the assassination of his older brother, John F. Kennedy. and the As CIA, he should, by the way, as he and, should. And the CIA was not going to have that because, as we all know now, they, they were complicit in it. Uh, uh, CIA agent David Sanchez Morales, who was seen by – one of my witnesses, Irene Gizzi, in a five-person group, including the third shooter and uh, two of his other CIA pals, and also the polka dot dress girl in a five-person group. Um, you know, David Sanchez Morales uh, said to his lawyer, I was there when we got John F. Kennedy, and I was there um, in Los Angeles when we got Bobby Kennedy. And yes, he was. He was there um, as part of a CIA element, that the rogue element of the CIA that, that assassinated JFK and RFK. So we know that. And another reason... That um, you know, the CIA couldn't have a Bobby Kennedy, you know, surviving this thing is because he was going to disband the CIA. He was going to get rid of it. He was going to destroy it. And so they're thinking, well, no, you're not going to do that to us, <laughs> you know. And and that was just something that that he was going to just do so many different things that they just didn't want to happen. Tell us about the books that are coming out. Okay, so um, that's the the first Robert Kennedy book that I'm working on. The second one I'm working on is with Scott Enyart, who's now 70 years old. But at the time of the shooting, he was an eyewitness to the Robert Kennedy assassination. He was 15 years old, and he was taking uh, pictures for Fairfax High, a school newspaper, high school newspaper. And so he's in there, and uh, he's taking pictures, and, and this woman tells the police, her name is Joan Barr. If you look at Joan Barr's police report, she says... Um, that kid was taking pictures as Robert Kennedy was being shot. And so the police went after Scott like a heat seeking missile, took his, uh, you know, film away, you know, um, at gunpoint. And uh, he, he took pictures as Robert Kennedy was being shot. So it's like this is a Pruder film of the Robert Kennedy assassination. And, and, and so at this point, he never gets his film back. The police lie to him and say that there's like a 20 year retention period where they got to hang on to this stuff and you'll get it back later. And then in 1996, Scott finally sues the city of Los Angeles, Scott Enyart versus the city of Los Angeles. He wins, um, you know, $400,000. And uh, he had that a little bit of the 600000 reversed on appeal. So now it's like 400000 that he wins. And uh, what the a city was saying on appeal was that there was a, a jury bias, an anti-police bias on part of the jury, which is just a bunch of nonsense. You see, the city didn't want to be the losers in this case. That's more believable now, by the way, than it might have been back then. <laughs> oh, sure. and, 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 and Scott was able to prove, and we have documentation for this, legal documentation, that it was, it was Skip, uh, Lewis Skip Miller, you know, the, the, the prosecutor for the city. They, hired, they paid him $2 million, you know, to you know, actually um, be the prosecutor, which is a lot of money. And, and uh, it, it turns out that Scott was able to prove that Skip Miller was the one that was doing the jury tampering. And so he got him disbarred for a day. <laughs> a whole day. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. But he got discipline, you know. Well, as well, he should be. There's a lot of intrigue surrounding both Kennedy's deaths, and I'll even extend one to uh, John Jr.'s death. There's a lot of conspiracy theories about that, too, or uh, possible, or I should say, I wouldn't even say conspiracy theories. I'd say possible theories, because, again, conspiracy theory has been tossed around at people who seem to be on to something when, uh, when, when they bring things up or they discuss things. This is not like saying, well, if the aliens came by and and, uh, and and planted colonies here a long time ago, that's a fun theory. But the fact is you get shouted down, you get denounced, you get thrown around, and uh, somebody's going to say, well, this book isn't very good. That guy's a conspiracy theorist, especially if you're on the right track. 
Yes, I mean, when you have people like uh, William um, Bailey, who was a former FBI agent, and he was assigned as an FBI agent to the Robert Kennedy case, and he, he did an affidavit to Vincent Bugliosi, the, you know, the Manson murder book, and a Helter Skelter, and, and you know, he um, basically said to Bugliosi, he says, I am absolutely certain I saw the bases of those bullets in those bullet holes. I didn't just see two bullet holes in the door frame. I saw two... Um, you know, 22 caliber bullets in those door frames. That's two plus the, you know, the other two we were talking about with uh, that didn't exit Kennedy, the one in the head and the one in the, in his neck, right? That's four. And then you have uh, five, which becomes nine, one each from each of the victims. Or there was one bullet pulled out of each of the victims in the hospital or, or anywhere where they had recovered them. And, and so we know that each of those five other victims besides Kennedy had one bullet each pulled out of them. You got five, two, and two is nine. That's that, that immediately becomes you know another gunman because because Sirhan only had eight bullets in his gun. He never had time to reload. We all know that. That's not in dispute. And so if what William Bailey is saying is is accurate, then we have a we have a second shooter um, you know problem, which even becomes a third shooter problem with the eyewitness testimony. You see, a lot of people have been focusing just on the second shooter, but what my book does is different is it brings the third shooter into the mix when he has been ignored all this time. Jim Margolis, thank you for being with me here on the Outhouse Lounge. We're going to be on the lookout for your new RFK books. But in the meantime, you want a good read? Check out My Merrill. This is My Merrill, Marilyn Monroe, Ronald Reagan, Hollywood and Me. It's uh, co-authored by Terry Cargo, who lived with, uh, who's, who's known Marilyn Monroe. I, yeah, they did kind of, I guess they kind of, I guess you could say they lived together because they they shared lives. Uh, she she was babysat by Marilyn Monroe, uh, knew who she really was. You want to get real insight to her and and, and not just the, the, the star-studded stuff, not just the act and not just uh, uh, what she accomplished in life, but deep down her, her inner thoughts, her her uh, her life, her, her family life, if you will. And and who and and who and, and the person you didn't know or the person who she was away from the camera. There you go. That's my that's my uh, that's my tangent for the moment. But if you want to do that, check this out. Check the book out. Pick it up. It's my Merrill, Marilyn Monroe, Ronald Reagan, Hollywood and me. She's uh, Terry Carter has a lot of stories to tell. Marilyn Monroe's life was amazing and even more amazing when you find out who she really was in this book. And yes, we're also, we also talk about uh, or at least Jay, you and uh, Terry also. Uh, discuss the unfortunate circumstances surrounding her death and what was what what happened afterward and the and the reason why it was not a suicide. So let's say it right now. Marilyn Monroe did not kill herself. Absolutely not. It was a homicide. Jay, thanks again for being with us. Uh, anybody, uh, if anybody is curious about you and, and your past books, where can they find out about them? They could go to Amazon.com or BarnesandNobles.com, any major booksellers. They can also go to my Instagram, which is basically my website, Marilyn Murdered. That's a murder with an ED at the end. So Marilyn Murdered. And that's uh, where you can find my Instagram. And uh, a singer, Boy George, follows me. He's a real big Marilyn fan, has been for many years. A great singer, too. Oh, absolutely. Just I love him. He's great. And uh, he's a very nice guy. And so uh, he is... Um, just a big, big Maryland fan. So if you want to uh, follow a uh, boy, George, you should go follow him too. <laughs> Look, this book turned me into one. I'll be honest with you. As I said before, I was not in the Maryland camp. Now I'm in the Maryland camp. Yes. I'm there. That's He's right. Intelligent and she was unjustly murdered. Yeah, it's awful. Find out more in the book. Jay, once again, thank you. And thank you all for joining me here in the Outhouse Lounge. <laughs>